contribute to the Canadian Cancer Society today. Can cancer be beaten? You, you bet, bet your, your life, life it, it can. can. BCTV! Good morning. Well, it should be a good morning, but to tell you the honest truth, it ain't all that good. Here we are teetering again on the edge of another election campaign provincially. Now, many of you wonder out there, what does it matter who's in power, whether it's the NDP or social credit? After all, Ottawa is the one with a clout. Now, with me this morning is Davy Barrett, who is going for the fourth time in his campaign, a leader of the NDP. Won one, lost two going to try and win the next one, if we have won this summer. Now, obviously, he can be kind of uh, unhappily happy because everything's going wrong for Bennett. Cominco is in serious trouble. Southeast coal, 1900 laid off. Northeast coal, considerable doubts. Uh, LNG plants uh, to Japan, a little bit airy-fairy. A 300 million or trillion feet of natural gas sale to the United States down the tube. I don't know whether that makes David Barrett happy or not, or whether or not he can do a damn thing about it. But let's put the solid, serious issues to Barrett this morning and see what he says after the break. Mr. Barrett, I have a feeling the mythical man in the pub or the mythical housewife at home or the mythical officer plant worker looks at conditions in British Columbia today and says, here we go again, another provincial campaign when we all know all the time that it's world markets which have collapsed and perhaps a fair share of the blame shot must be placed on the people with power, the federal government. And what, after all, can a uh, provincial government of any stripe really do when said Webster as he lists the litany of disaster, Cominco, Southeast Coal, Northeast Coal, natural gas jubiety, prospect of losing a newly signed contract for $600 million a year on 300 million cubic feet of gas per day. And now, sir, you're about to fight a campaign on the fact that you can't stand Van der Zam, you think he's a redneck, and you're going to use little children with placards around their necks, a kind of children's crusade, really, to poison the election spirit in British Columbia. Well, first of all, uh, Jack, uh, the use of children is not my idea, nor did I drag children or the education system into a political debate. And we'll just deal with that as we get to it. The first items you raised, the world economy, it is true that the economy is down, but there are things that we can and should be doing in British Columbia to deal with that. We have lost some of our leverage. And it is impossible to deal with today's problems without discussing history a little bit. While it is true to protect governments by saying the world economy is down, in 1975, when there was a slight bump in the economy, the NDP was blamed for everything. I just want to put that in perspective, because at that time, the vicious attack on our government was there was no consideration of world scale. Now, having dealt with that, let's look at some of the things that we've let slip by in a downturn in the world economy. Number one, BRIC. We took assets worth $450 million, played a political game with them, dumped them into the stock market, turned around and lost that leverage to now where BRIC has a debt of $1,100,000,000. That is directly Bill Bennett's fault, not world economy. Let me stop there. You're talking now, you, when you said we, you meant Bennett taking the crown assets, which you had brought into the crown, putting them out. Now, I don't suppose that either one of you, Bennett or the NDP, or BRIC or the NDP, could have saved the jobs in these industries. 
Is the point you're making that an additional billion dollar in debt has been created? A billion, one hundred million dollars debt has been created that could have been socially and economically converted to job creation here in British Columbia that we could have controlled in British Columbia. Well, that billion dollar in debt, was that the investments in a Kaiser and Southeast Coal, for instance? Six hundred million went to Kaiser right off the top. Where did the rest go? The rest are going into uh, other assets and losses in the crown uh, corporations that they held. But those losses have had to be paid for by borrowed money, no longer out of the income or cash flow of the companies as they were surviving. What we did was we took viable enterprises and loaded debt on them and picked up a coal operation that was totally in private hands, totally in private hands. We bought that through brick, and now we're opening with public money a billion and a half dollars of public money competing coal mines for Southeast. Those two problems are specifically the responsibility of Bill Bennett and Social Credit. Even if, at this stage, uh, if they had not brought, bought Kaiser, Kaiser might still have laid off 1,900 people. Kaiser may have laid off 1,900 people, but Kaiser would not be under the pressure, i.e. BC Coal would not be under the pressure of diminishing markets. That is going to accelerate. There's only a limited amount of coal that Japan is going to buy. And if they have two sources to buy it from, one brick and northeast, they're going to whipsaw the two areas for a lower price. Well, they'll tell me that there are different kinds of coal. One is thermal, one isn't thermal. And Bennett will tell me that if you get into power, the first thing you would do is annoy the Japanese by attempting to renegotiate the Northeast coal contracts. Jack Webster, are we in the business of not annoying the Japanese? The Japanese are not the ones responsible. They have been given a gift, and they've never looked the gift in the mouth. Where else could the Japanese go to divide their market share in a competing way within one jurisdiction? They also buy coal from Australia, from the United States, and now two places in British Columbia. So you're telling me that Bennett's biggest blunder is still his mishandling, his abominable mishandling of brick? Well, the abominable mishandling of brick was an ideological decision he made. He took crown assets that were fully paid for. The only mortgage was on Cancel. It was $69 million. Played a political game with it. Spent $40 million in taxpayers' money just in propaganda and giving away the free shares. Got himself reelected. Washed his hands of it. And we have a $1 billion, $100 million debt. All right. To be positive, if you were to... One, is there going to be an election? Do you think he's going to teeter on the edge again and back off if there's a spring downturn? I don't think anybody really knows except... Does he know? No, I think that those people that he brought from Ontario will make the decision. We are no longer in the hands in British Columbia of political leadership. We're in the hands of image makers. Oh, now, don't give me that. Don't tell me that Bill Bennett, surrounded by these people, can't make up his own mind to call an election. I'm not telling you that. The record tells you that. What about last uh, September? We haven't sat in that house for five months. Last September, everything was geared for an election. He brought in the Warren Commission. We promised a job. What's program. his problem? What, uh, analyze Bill Bennett. This isn't going to be a nice Nelly campaign. Maybe not many dirty tricks, but maybe not nice <laughs> Nelly. Analyze him. First of all, it started What's off. What's wrong with, with Bennett? First of all, let's, it started off with dirty tricks. About a million and a half dollars worth of dirty tricks and government advertising for so cred purposes. That's number one. Number two. Not up to now. Not in this campaign. Well, already they've spent in Crown Corporations and the other ads are up to about a million and a half dollars worth of ads. You're not just complaining about the uh, province reports $440,000. That's just peanuts compared to the rest of the stuff. Look at the Crown Corporations. There's even going to be more ads. I predict within a week, 90% chance that... Are you saying that Bill Bennett is not fit to be Premier of this province because he can't make up his mind? No, we haven't even got to that part yet. We're talking about the ads. In terms of not making up his mind, the record stands. Whether or not he's fit to be Premier or not is not the issue we're discussing now. We're discussing is he making up his mind or not to call an election. I say that he's not in control of that decision. He's under the influence of the advisors from Ontario, plus polling, polling, polling. All right. So if, if you were, if then, I hate this hypothetical business. Okay. I mean, they brought us to the edge last fall. Now yeah. we're right on the edge of the cliff again. Yeah, right. There's not a dash thing I'd suggest to you, Mr. Barrett, you can do to rehabilitate Southeast Coal or Northeast Coal in your socialist image. There are two things we can do in terms of the coal itself. We must sit down and develop a provincial marketing strategy for all the coal produced in British Columbia. No one can turn the clock back now on the amount of money and the commitment to Northeast Coal. That's number one. Number two, we renegotiate 
as I spoke to the Japanese in 1980 in Tokyo, when I was asked to come and speak and meet with people, renegotiate Northeast to get value added of more jobs in that project, more fabrication, more additional, the, the additional investment in shipping, the additional investment in transportation all over. Now, those things I've clearly discussed time and time again. More with Dave Barrett, leader of the NDP, after the break. When I go back to the economy, one question, Mr. Barrett. Have you been deliberately lying very, very low indeed, groundhog style, <laughs> convinced that, ba that Van der Zam Bennett and company will cut their own throats and you don't have to do much? I have been doing what I've always done, and that is travel throughout the province. I spend most of my time on the road. I've just come back from an extensive trip through uh, Grand Forks, Penticton, South Okanagan area. I'll be going up north shortly after that. I spend most of my time on the road. Come to education later, but back to your provincial marketing board, yeah. which you have now advocated for the marketing, the orderly marketing yeah. to prevent swip whipsawing of north and southeast coal. Yes. Right? Yeah. What I'm talking about is not the same thing as the British Columbia Petroleum Corporation. I'm talking about a voluntary agreement between all coal producers and the government to work together to assess their share of the markets that probably are going to diminish even more in Japan. Further, some discussions with the Americans and with the Australians. Now, there may be a change of government in Australia within a week. There is a more receptive, if the change is to Bob Hawke and Labour, there'll be a more receptive atmosphere to deal with a joint marketing strategy. Maybe you can whipsaw the Japanese. Well, it's not a question of allowing us to be whipsawed or whipsawing the customer. The question is that we all have to understand we have mutual interests. What has happened is the balance has been tipped in favor of the customer, i.e. the Japanese. Your great invention, a tax gathering body of which you are inordinately proud in good times was the BC Petroleum Corporation. Right. Right. Suddenly we see two things last week. Brian Smith exhorts people to go out and put natural gas in their furnaces in Vancouver Island on this supposed new gas line. And then all of a sudden we're told a $600 million contract for gas to, I think it was to New England and right. California, signed us down the tube. Now. You can't blame social credit for that. Yes. Nobody wants dear Canadian gas. And you were the guy that hammered up the price through Ottawa. Sure, and then we didn't get up far enough. We lost $600 million between 76 and 79 selling cheap gas. What we've lost is our markets. Because of price. No, Jack. When the pre-bill was allowed, that's what Ian Waddell has been fighting through in the courts. He is at the federal level, the one person who's understand, understood right from day one what happened. When we allowed the Americans the pre-build, Alberta got access to Northern California gas markets that were traditionally building up to be ours. The Americans have refused to go through with the rest of the gas pipeline, as Waddell predicted. Is Alberta stealing our gas markets in the they States? They have uh, low heat creamed Bennett by getting access to those markets. We then had to spread out. West Coast has done a good job. The private sector has done a good job. They spread out looking for new markets. The Americans are now in a position to put pressure on us to drop the price of gas because they have Alberta, BC competing for unregulated markets in the states. There may have to be a brief downturn of price. However, oh, say that again. BC may have to cut the price again. There may have to be a brief downturn in price at the federal level, but we want other things discussed at the same time. Jack, I made it very clear that this government had missed the responsibility of dealing with the tariffs that may be coming up on BC lumber. By single issue orientation, by being afraid of the US markets, we have never rationally laid out what is mutually good for both of us. Are you back to your threats? No. Cutting off the gas? Look, the Americans are threatening us. I'm not threatening anybody. They're threatening us with a tariff. I don't, uh, people don't seem to get to understand that they're threatening us in a traditional market. And, and you we, would threaten them? No, you bargain, you don't threaten, you sit down and say, look fellas, you cannot isolate one commodity. But we're in a bad bargaining position at the moment because they don't need our gas. They're going to they're need our the gas three to four years from now. There is no panic to shovel gas out of this province 
at a cut rate price. There may be some benefit in a short-term cut in price if there are reciprocal benefits for British Columbians and Canadians. No panic, caution, prudence, careful use of that resource, but a plan, not just ad hoc running around one commodity separate from another. Can you explain to me why they were apparently all set to sign this $600 million contract with Texas Eastern and Transwestern Pipeline, and suddenly it falls apart. Well, we Why bother to sign it in the first place? We got a signal of that when uh, about four months ago, four U.S. congressmen were up here lobbying against the high price of Canadian gas. Incidentally, the Mexicans have not dropped their natural gas It's about price. $6 a thousand cubic feet. Yes, yeah. Okay. Now, once they started the lobbying, then they set the atmosphere around, well, we'd like to buy more, but get the price down. The Americans are the best business people around. They understand how to do business. All I'm saying is we should respond by saying we may consider a temporary price cut. You would do that now in the middle of the tariff war on well, the countervailing duties. You have to do that because it's all politics. I warned six months ago that if they allowed the tariff business to proceed to that commission, we'll probably end up with bonding within a week simply because the politicians were asleep at the switch and they isolated one commodity. It is a mixed commodity market we're dealing with. And Bill Bennett and that group have not really understood that. Bennett has failed properly to fight the possibility of countervailing bonds or duties on lumber, right? Yes, they have failed, and so has the federal government. This happened once before, and the federal government was aggressive with the provinces. This province has failed because they did not realize the significance of that tariff threat. What is a countervailing or a bond of 5 or $10 a thousand going to do to BC's industry? The 5 or $10 per se will not be damaging, but the threat of further costs and the bonding building up will diminish our markets. There'll be a rush to buy before the bonding comes into place. Then the American producers will get the uh, upturn in the American housing market while we lag and the commission does its thing with the tariffs. This should have been settled politically a long time ago. It will further damage our markets, particularly British Columbia. Before we come back to that, one question which you might be able to answer. Is it correct that there is a possibly a firm deal to LNG natural gas out of Kitimat to the Japanese? Or is that so much as I suspect pie or gas in the sky? There is a possibility. But it's not firm. Not firm. And uh, I discussed this possibility with uh, Dome. I'll admit that uh, publicly. I, uh, they uh, briefed me and I said uh, that if we were in government, we would consider endorsing the export of gas. However, our condition would be some of the carrying capacity of that gas in Canadian built ships, in Canadian shipyards. Dome at that time took a public position that they would go to Canadian built ships. They even talked of a shipyard at Britannia, which I didn't think was appropriate. We have the facilities both in Burrard oh, and yeah, Yarrow. The big uh, gas port of Britannia, about over which everyone shuddered about. Well, it was the uh, ship construction they talked about. That's okay, right. Dome has abandoned that position. Dome has abandoned that public position of building ships to carry the gas. My position is there is a possibility of shipping LNG. There will be a need of long-term commitment, but no way unless there is value added for Canadians and British Columbia. By value added, you mean employee content? We have, uh, we have nearly 600,000 people in British Columbia today who now depend on welfare or unemployment insurance. If we're going to sell a resource... Ah, that's a somewhat specious extrapolation, Mr. Barrett. Ah, uh, not at all. There's I, only I was 2,400,000 people in the province. I was very careful to use the Ministry of Human Resources own figures and the UIC. And if you want to go through them in detail, I'd I like will. I'd like 215,000 claiming unemployment insurance. No, there are 170,000 open cases of UIC. There's 250... 170,000 receiving checks, 257,000 open cases. Right. Okay. There are now over 200,000 so, uh, social welfare dependents. 100,000 cases doubled. Right. That's what it is. Now, on top of that, you look at another uh, probably 90,000 auxiliaries that are current on the welfare rolls that will always be there. You're looking at close to 600,000 people. If you include all old age security recipients, 
and gain. You, you drop 90 of those and you're, well, you're still over half a million people, Jack. The total is 600,000. Isn't that the NDP Valhalla, the majority of people on guaranteed government income? My dear friend, I don't believe in wasting public money on welfare. If you're going to borrow money for welfare, why don't we borrow it to put people to work? More with Dave Barrett after the break. Still on the economy with Mr. Barrett, and he's talking about the possibility of a, a kind of warning to the United States that there's more than one issue involved, correct? It's not a warning. It's bargaining a position. Bargaining position, exactly. Too late now, though, isn't it? No, I don't believe so. I believe that uh, all commissions are uh, subject to political input. That's why uh, there is an attempt now by the federal government, the provincial government. The input should have taken place before it went this far. Now, rational people sitting down discussing mutual interests can always find a compromise. What has to be understood is that we do not bargain on single commodity bases. The problem has been that both Ottawa and British Columbia have been paralyzed about the polls and politics without rationally understanding the whole business range we're dealing Mr. with. Mr. Barrett, there are certain things which only free enterprise can do either well or badly, and I want to give you two examples. Bill Cordoban of Carrier Lumber, running two shifts all through this recession market. 82 million feet stockpiled for sale on a gamble. Shimenas, one of the great old time mills, closed down forever. Cordoban, good free enterpriser. Mack and Blow. Free enterprisers. Good free enterprises? Well, ever since Noranda took over, there's been a different attitude in terms of management. But, but you would step in, your enemies saying it's a, he'd subsidize them to, to produce uneconomic lumber just for the sake of political tactics. Well, my enemies say all kinds of things, but, but my, record, what they say. my record speaks for itself. When we ran Cancel, we made $154 million in the first two years. Now, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of luck, but we also made a very good business deal. We bought Plateau Mills, Kootenay Forest Products. Would we, you buy Shimanus from Mack and Blow? And no, we work? would not buy Shimanus, but we would face companies with their social responsibility using Tom Waterland's threat, not mine. Use it or lose it is what Waterland said. You're saying that you, like Waterland indicated at one time, if a forest operator doesn't live up to his proper commitment, should lift his tree farm license. Well, there is a free enterprise competitive bid out there for that timber. But they get them forever. You know that, and well, I know Well, those 21-year leases come up for renewal. Now, I don't want anyone to go out of here saying Barrett's threatening. All I'm saying is I listen to Waterland. Waterland said, use it or lose it. I find that an attractive approach. If he says it, it's business. If I say it, it's threatening. Let's not play semantics. The facts are that that's our resource, and there is a social obligation in the use of that resource to protect people's jobs. Do the unions have any sense of so social obligation just now? Take, for instance, the fuss over the closure of most of the union shingle mills. Don't you think that the unions could have shown a lot more common sense by giving a little bit to keep jobs going? I think when the economy is booming, the companies should show a little more sense and add extra money beyond the contract. It's interesting, Jack, how we try to pick out villains. At this stage in our economy, the traditional villain, villains, whether it is labor or management, are no longer relevant. We're in one heck of a mess, and we had better start sitting down with industry, with the trade union movement, and government in a cooperative way, planning how we're going to get out of this mess. Any government that deliberately sets out to single any group for political purposes at a time like this has lost its own political morality. Do you remember the panic in the mining industry when you brought in your first mining act, Mr. Barrett? There's more panic in the mining industry today, and I haven't been around for six years. When those markets drop, those markets drop. We have not sat down with the mining industry as a government to deal with the problems they've got. Some created by social credit when they increased the water license rates to those operations. Oh, the $300 million takes with the BC Hydro Yes, and it was done just a sleight of hand. And here's Cominco and the other parts of the mining industry suffering because of actions of the social credit government who have not seen coordinated impact of their own decisions. But they needed the money. They've even gone to treasury bills and net Look, debt. They are borrowing money in this province at the rate of $50 million 
dollars a week and they're pouring it into welfare and other programs with no positive result. I say that's foolish. Sheer desperation. I think so. And I think it's obvious uh, and, and anybody who examines this government, five months, no session, running the government by polls, no cabinet solidarity, fights breaking out in different areas, no proposals to lay out long-term plans of how we're going to get out of this mess. The Crown Corporation's piling up debt like you wouldn't believe. BC Rail, 400 million in addition that they said they would never build to BC Rail. It's there. It's completely focused on getting social credit re-elected rather than dealing with the problems. All well, right, we've covered mining, we've covered lumber, we've covered gas. And these are the mainstays of our economy. There are other areas too, and the secondary manufacturing is where we need to give the biggest boost of all. And they're value added. I'm talking about secondary manufacturing related to our basic commodities. When we talk about gas, it should be linked with ships to carry it. When we talk about lumber, we should be talking about no export of logs but manufacturing here. When we talk about other parts of mining, we should be talking about subsidiary developments, a small steel mill, shipbuilding, and reopening that rail car plant. When your ghost walks it with a small steel mill hovering over its well, head. I want to tell you, Jack, <laughs> when my ghost walks, and I hope it walks, <laughs> not for a long time yet, if these things are not done, then it won't be my ghost that haunts us. It'll be the rising welfare rolls and the rising unemployment rules. And what have you got for this alternative at the moment? Either you or Stupich came up with either one or two schemes. I think it was half a billion dollars for municipal construction. We did was the same. 2,500 jobs. Last March, we presented a detailed outline. In September, I went to the UBCM and laid out a proposal in terms of public works on the same basis that Roosevelt moved the Americans out of the Depression. OK, public works, roads, sewers, sidewalks, parks. Okay, now, this money is made available to the municipalities, not the provincial government. Let the municipalities get involved at a 90% grant to them. They have to have the money. They're best able to handle it at the local level. This money immediately into the economy. In December, I wrote every single municipality, town, and village in this province and said to them, if in the event there is a change of government, and if in the event this program was available, what could you have ready? I have already received 35 replies of towns, villages, and cities ready to go. If How that would money you get a half billion for it? I said in advance from the British Columbia Petroleum Corporation, that is one crown corporation that does not have any debt. It is the one corporation, again started by us, that has a guaranteed future. BCPC would advance and guarantee the half billion. That's right. The same way money is guaranteed to Whistler. My goodness gracious. Nothing wrong with that deal, was well, there? I think it's silly because there are, well, when are you going to stop bailing out private enterprisers? Is this a socialist government giving welfare to private enterprisers? If you're going to give government guarantees, if you're going to give government grants, then you must protect the taxpayers by some equity. What equity have we got? Your questions and calls today, Barrett, after I've touched on the educational, I think it's fair to say it's a shambles at the moment, one way and another, after the break. Mind you, I don't know if there's that much difference between your policies and desperate big business. I was listening to Lee Iacocco yesterday uh, saying that the government must guarantee industries that are going down the tube or all the jobs will be lost. Iacocca has moved to a position that we have been talking about for the last three years. Iacocca's statement, in my opinion, was brilliant. He made it very clear that unless there is consumer spending power in the pockets of working people, the economy is going to suffer even more. His statement was that there is a role for government in guaranteeing an equity. He proved it in his company. Iacocca and the unions deserve all the credit <coughs> for pulling that company out. They're showing black for the first time, but he has had the courage to state publicly that it has to be government intervention to pull us out of the, the, the doldrums that we're in. All right, now you haven't laid down a formal platform yet for the campaign because you don't quite know if it's a campaign or not. We have laid out about half of our platform to this point. All right, on education, okay. if there's no money in the kitty, how can the teachers keep 
talking about the quality of education when they are the best treated segment of organized society. Look, the Why should they not take a cut along with the 600,000 people on government assistance? The teachers can handle themselves. Let us talk about what has happened psychologically to education. You have a minister who's come out and made threats to the teachers rather than deal with the economic situation. There has been no mature meeting between government boards and teachers and parents. No plan. No plan. It has been a... Bill 89 set down certain structures. Uh, that was pulled out of the 24-hour air pocket that they have when they're in desperation in Victoria. If we're going to have a decent, long-term, meaningful education program, it cannot come out of confrontation between a minister who uses rhetoric and symbols against teachers who respond similarly because they are attacked. We must calm the whole thing down, rationalize what we've got, and move on to five-year or seven-year planning in the education But in field. the meantime, even you would have to trim, if not cut, educational expenses. I will, I will predict on this show, to prove how politics are running education in British Columbia, that at the last minute some extra money will be found before a provincial election to top up education budgets. And to avoid layoffs. Well, they will top it up to go into an election purely for political purposes, and I predict it. You notice that they allow themselves to borrow an extra $30 million. My prediction is that will be thrown in by a mag magnanimous government. Magnanimous. A magnanimous government. Magnanimous. No, magnanimous. Magnanimous. <laughs> magnanimous government. A political government. A political government. But the basic fact is, one of the dangerous things I suspect is how they're dividing people. Because many people on the low end of the totem pole look at the teachers and think, my God, they're well paid. Why shouldn't they take look, a cut? N far fewer children in the schools and far more administrators than teachers, you sometimes think. Well, these are kind of generalizations that may be appropriate in Can't some areas. Get the figures. Can't okay, get the no, figures. okay, and they should back up their argument with right. figures. But look, Jack. Let's, let's reasonably understand that we have two ministers with countervailing points of view. Here we have McGeer, who is looking at the highbrow education. Huh? Okay, and that's really what it is, highbrow education. Demanding excellence, demanding more preparation, extolling the virtues of well-prepared students for a rapidly changing society. Here he is. Here's the other one saying, back to R's, the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic without any appreciation of a highly changing, sophisticated world that the other minister is talking about. But the other minister destroys his argument by allowing that half million dollar renovation for the president's residence, well, in, you know, in terms of simplistic things, while van der Zam makes rhetorical statements attacking administrators. There's got to be some rationale, some You would say the social down. credit cabinet just doesn't know what it's doing. Look, they're all going at sixes and sevens. Bennett's reading the polls and trying to come up with some answers on polling rather than leading the province. The cabinet is out of touch with each other mm -hmm. and there is no sense that someone is running the ship and we have a coordinated plan. Will it be to your advantage? Oh, Bennett w must call a uh, spring session before he drops the writ. Am I correct on that? Uh, he can drop the writ without a spring session. The deadline is April the 15th. They run out of spending authority on April the 15th. They cannot pay March 31st uh, bills uh, with new money. They can go two weeks into April and that's it. He either has to drop the writ or call the session. If he calls the session, he could call the session for two or three days, yes. bring in a throne speech, Make Bring the promises and then drop the rent. That's correct. That may be part of the strategy plan because we. this is, the again, one of the latest years. Last year was late when we thought there was going to be a spring election. We didn't call it. Again, we're late. We don't have a budget in front of us. When WAC was premier, we had that budget in front of us in February. When we were in government, it was February. People knew. Now, he's stalling. He's got till the middle of April to make his choice politically. Everything he's doing right now is political. One technical question. Must he call the session before he drops the writ? No? No, not necessarily. If he drops the writ before April the 15th, the government operates on warrants while the election campaign is on. Why, you're going to be in trouble financially because the per capita of the unions is down and they won't be able to give you the manpower to help you with the elections this year. Look, I would love the help of everybody, trade unionists, teachers, doctors, broadcasters, whoever. It is not money that we can compete with. 
even though there are people out there who are giving money to the How party. How much did you spend on these lavish, no-frill ads you're putting out? $50,000, $1,000 for production, and $49,000 worth of time. We spread them over, we're, we're, you know, we, we've got a few dollars. We're not spending taxpayer dollars. We're running a five-week program, but what we've done is one week on, one week off, one week on, one week off. And we think those ads uh, prove the contrast very well. Your questions and comments to Dave Barrett, leader of the NDP, on his last hurrah if he doesn't win? win? No one can predict the future, Jack. No one can predict How old are you now, Mr. Barrett? I am 52 years old, full of vim and vigor. I've never felt better in my life and more sure about what I'm doing politically than I do right now. You're much more to the right than you used to be. Oh, I think the whole world has moved our direction, including Lee Iacocca. We have many strange friends when the world changes. Barrett. And Webster and Barrett, Barrett and Webster will give them equal billing after the break. Okay. I think we can dispense with niceties from callers this morning. No, none of this. Good morning, Mr. Barrett. Is that you, Mr. Barrett? Good morning, Jack. Can I speak to Mr. Barrett? Get straight to the point, and this is the first call. Go ahead, please. Mr. Barrett. Yes, sir. Might I point out to you, sir, that in this hard-pressed economy, my 800 shares of brick are emerging as a blue-chip survival stock. In spite of your ceaseless and endless innuendo smear campaigns against the government that created it and its present management. When compared to the stock of some other corporations that you and your party have launched similar sm smear campaigns against, such as corporate oil and banks, particularly the Bank of Commerce, my brick shares are doing fine, and I'll hang on to it until such a disastrous moment in BC until you, you and your government, you form the government again, in which case you'll find that my suitcases are packed and ready to go. And Hold I'm on. Just go on. don't panic, sir. Don't panic. Remember this. That performance is based on the fact that the companies that founded BRIC were bought by the New Democratic Party. You've just proven that we're wiser in the marketplace than the other corporations you mentioned. Thank you. Go ahead, please. Yes, David. Yes, sir. For every suitcase that that man has packed, there's been three or four hundred people coming into uh, B.C. from eastern Canada who are, will not sit around and watch a government throw it down the tubes the way many B.C.ers will, and they'll kick this government out. Look. We have a serious economic situation in this province. A rational debate around the economic options that exist for us British Columbians is what must take place in the next election. I'm telling you that in this rich province, it is a moral disgrace that we have 215,000 people out of work. Can you imagine how social credit would scream if they were in opposition? Go ahead from Victoria. Yeah, Barrett. And, uh I'd like to know how your government is going to handle uh, things in tough economic times when you had trouble uh, running things when they weren't so tough. Well, my dear friend, we left $552 million in cash, checked with public accounts. 300 there was by W.A.C. Bennett. We added $252 million. We left $450 million worth of assets, 80% of which were paid. We had the highest number of people employed in British Columbia up to that point. The record was there. That money is now gone, the assets are gone, so you figure it out. Why were you defeated? Because we had a coalition on the right. We won with 39% of the vote. We lost with 39.1% of the vote. In 1979, we moved our vote up to 46% of the vote. There is no Liberal Party. There is no Conservative Party. They join together, and that is why we were defeated. It's simply numbers. Go ahead, but please, from Kelowna. Yes, good morning, Dave. Yes. Um, I spoke with Mr. Bennett on your show, uh, or on Jack's show about four months ago, and he promised some new jobs in the nursing field here in Kelowna. Well, I'm a certified nurse aide, and I'm still unemployed, and I'd like to know what you're going to do about the nursing staff that's on such a tight freeze in all the hospitals throughout British Columbia. Okay. All right. Now, at the present time, there are now over 900 nurses in British Columbia on unemployment insurance. 900. Now, we are suffering a destruction of the quality of health care, stated by medical practitioners, not by politicians. We just got another warning about Victoria's hospitals last week. We must sit down and bring 
back to the scale of operation those hospitals that were giving us the best care possible. It is true that we suffer hardships in the economy. It is true that there are strains. But I tell you that there were other cuts that we proposed for two years that the Socreds voted against that that money could have gone They're to hospitals. They're talking about cutting all the consultant fees. The fact that the was to bat it, you can't accuse social credit of being tough in either hospitals or welfare because $4 billion of our total budget goes to hospitals, welfare, another couple of billion for education. That percentage share has been sent relatively stable up until the cuts in the last two years, whether it was social credit or NDP. The no doubt there was need for trimming and efficiency in all our systems. Well, Years we, of affluence made us soft and sappy. For two years, before this current downturn, we proposed cuts, all recorded votes of $152 million. Not in health care. Not talking in health care. I'm talking about travel, advertising, furniture, rentals, all of them recorded votes. All of them. And everyone voted against. Go ahead, credit. please. Go ahead, please. Mr. Barrett. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm a trade unionist. and I've worked on almost every major construction site in British Columbia. And uh, I'd like to know if you got uh, if you got back in as uh, as premier, uh, where would you start to uh, uh, you know clear this mess up that we're in? You know, I mean the first thing we must do. Uh, in BC place has been a godsend. You know? The first thing we must do is get people back to work in the construction area. Mm -hmm. That is the major expenditure we're talking about because it has the best spin-off at the local level public works as Roosevelt created. Five hundred million dollars for municipal projects. I mentioned to Jack already that we have written the municipalities asking them if we were in government would they be ready with projects. A, a significant number have answered within the short period of two months. More answering. That is the first shot uh -huh. at, the, at the local level. That's where we can create the most jobs in the fastest manner. I, can't, I put in a little nag there, but you got to give Bennett credit for BC Place. It supplied $128 million of the jobs in the stadium yeah. and quite a few others. Look, if you want to build a, a, uh, a, a, well, you want to build a pyramid, we'll create jobs. What are we going to put inside the stadium? The White Caps or the Lions, another place to lose? Come on, Jack, we've made a capital expenditure that has given uh, jobs, certainly, but what have we got? What is the integrated role of that stadium in terms of entertainment and use? Look at the bill. If they want to borrow money for a stadium, that's a one way of creating jobs. Another way of creating jobs is money at the local level, not so spectacular. Roads, sewers, sidewalks and parks. No big opening, no numerous openings, but steady, hard rock work right at the local level. BC Place itself might revitalize downtown Vancouver. And what does it do for Prince George? What does it do for Karameas? What does it do for Cranbrook? This is one province of a whole area, not just one showpiece. Go ahead, please. Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Dave. Good morning. I uh, met you, oh, I guess it was back in 75. I'll never forget. Uh, at that time, of course, I was on the other side of the fence politically, and I've since changed my views, slowly but surely. You want to buy time, or do you want to say something? <laughs> yes, I want to say something. Uh, Dave? Yes, sir. Well, number one, what, is, what uh, impact, if any, do you feel the Green Party may have on the current situation? Number two, what no. retraining programs would you recommend for people who are currently on un unemployment insurance or welfare? I don't know what impact the Green Party has. No. And, and, and I, Zilch. Well, you're probably right. In the retraining, we must complete the apprenticeship programs that we've got a significant number of people halfway through. In that sense, this program, Webster's program, has done a public service in pointing out the significant number of people who were cut off halfway through. Oh, BC Hydro was so stupid. Uh, they could have phased out these uh, electrician apprentices and at least given them their tickets. But one of the problems there is the union agreement. Well, the okay. union didn't want the apprentices to finish because they would have got their seniority okay. back. They could have sat down and negotiated this out. And the same exists, Jack, in other areas. But we have confrontation instead of a deliberate atmosphere of bringing people My together. My opinion is that the apprenticeship system in this province doesn't work in any way, shape, or form. It needs an overhaul. It needs cooperation between the Department of Education, the Department of Labor, the trade and labor, unions. labor, and management. Federal and provincial. We lost tragically one of the key people who was beginning to pull this all together in Jim Kinnaird 
Jim Kinnaird is going to be very difficult to replace, but at least he started the atmosphere for that kind of cooperation to take place. More with Dave Barrett, leader of the NDP. He doesn't know any more than I do if we are or are not teetering on the edge of an election, correct? I, correct, I don't know. After the break. These are staggering figures. Yes, they are. UIE exhaustee study prepared by Employment and Immigration Canada. That's right. British Columbia, July 82 to June 83, about 8,000. 8,000 a month, up from about two and 3,000 uh, a year and a half ago, two years ago. We're going to have staggering welfare costs in this province unless we create more jobs. These are the government's own figures. In July 80, it was 3,900. 3,700 in 81, 82, 7,600 to 8,300 to up to June 83. That is every month. That's the number of people coming. Added. Added. Now, in the old days, about 15, 8 to 15 percent went on welfare. Now they're estimating 40 percent minimum are going on welfare off of UIC every that's month. 12 months. That's 84,000 of BC extra by June 83. We may double the number of people receiving mm. a check directly from welfare within the next 12 months. Go ahead to Dave Barrett. Hello. That's you. Okay. Dave, what are you going to do about an ordinary laborer from the lumber mill? Look, the first thing we must do in the forest industry is a massive recommitment to reforestation. We had, under the soak reds, a commitment of a five-year program to start reforestation. They chopped that out. Now, this is long-term investment in the forest industry. We cannot put everybody back to work, but we can put a significant number of people out there for a long-term commitment on reforestation. One government demonstrated that program and its use was under Prime Minister Savage in New Zealand in 1935 to 1939. Oh. They are now reaping that harvest in New Zealand on a competitive basis. As a matter of fact, one of the major New Zealand companies is buying out Crown Zeller back in BC. We must have local jobs, reforestation is one, parks, roads, sewers, that's the area. You've got to have a basis of income for your offshore trading. Look, we can start negotiating secondary value on offshore trading, but under social credit, we are putting more and more people on welfare. We are bending over backwards in resource sellouts without negotiating ship without uh, negotiating carrying capacity, secondary manufacturing that they promised would take place. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd like to know, Dave, uh, if you're going to change those bozos that are higher up at Hydro there for, for and put us apprentices back to work. The apprentice program must be completed. That is a social obligation. Now, the problems with the union and the problems with the company exist. Those can be dealt with through negotiation, but those apprentices must be given the right to finish that apprenticeship. Well, certainly if you became the leader of the government, Bonner wouldn't stay as chairman of Hydro. Let's be frank about it. I, I doubt if he'd want to stay. <laughs> you certainly are the diplomat would you have to be. <laughs> very well done. Um, go ahead, please. Yes, sir. I'm, uh, in listening today this morning, he stuck a very, cor a very sincere chord with me when he started talking about the export of our Canadian goods and references Canadian shipbuilding. I'm very concerned about the Northeast Coal fiasco and that uh, it would appear to me that uh, jobs stop for Canadians when the coal hits the port of Prince Rupert or Ridley Island. And I'm very concerned that we don't see any shipbuilding going on in Canada to export that coal. And I'm wondering if it's too late should the NDP party get re-elected, and I'm positive in my mind they're going to. Is it too late that we can do something to get that coal exported in Canadian ships and by Canadian seamen? Good question. Excellent question. I don't think it's too late. I don't think it's too late, but you must understand that there are now four ships being contracted for that coal. Two in Korea for $80 million, two in Belgium. Now, there appear to be some problems in the Belgian operation. I'm not sure what those problems are. Those four ships should have been contracted here. The Stacker Reclaimer is manufactured in Japan. The, uh, the first components con in Ontario. Uh, components in Ontario. The first contracts on the engineering for the tunnels, ninety-one million dollars worth, and two contracts went to Atkinson Commonwealth of San Francisco. The uh, conveyor belt that will be built to the tunnels is going to be built in France. The components and, and some ad will be done here. 
we must go back, as I said to the Japanese when they invited me over in 80, because they read polls too, and they realize we may win an election. I sat down with them and said, look, we want to sell our resources, we must sell commodities in BC to survive, but there is a secondary price. We want reinvestment in British Columbia to maximize the job potential of those resources. Not worldwide competition for shipping, not worldwide competition for steel mill, just our domestic needs built in to our own production. Go ahead, please. Um, yes, Mr. Webster, you asked Mr. Barrett how much money they'd spent on their no frills ads, which they'd use their own money for. I'd like to know how many taxpayers' dollars were used on the Spirit of BC commercials with Fred Latramont. Well, I'm estimating that calling all of you together, the Crown Corporations, about. Oh, yeah. Dave Barrett, leader of the NDP. Kind of grim face this morning. Nothing very funny to laugh about. There's, uh, look, uh, we're in one heck of a mess, uh, and I'm not offering uh, magic solutions. I'm just saying that with some common sense and a bit of planning, we can pull ourselves out. We, there is hope out there. I mean, there's not an awful lot of difference between the NDP and today's human uh, populistic social credit, really. There the is question a... of which would be the more efficient, really. No, Jack. I mean, you're not about to implement socialist philosophy There is nowadays. a great difference. When they talk about cutting back, they make sure it's the poor that cut back in the renter's grant. Renter's grant oh, and those, the, the working poor who are also subsidizing welfare. They're the ones who need the money. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, hits that he's given on to Cominco is irrational to prop up hydro. It is a hop, skip, and jump government that has no plan whatsoever. Go ahead, please. Hello? That's you, ma'am. Mr. Barrett. Yes, ma'am. I was wondering, since uh, all politicians are so concerned about the poor today, and the public welfare, why the politicians do not consider accepting the same wage for their services as which they're willing to dish out to the poor welfare. Well, you know, the interesting thing is that uh, the, uh, my income has gone up significantly under social credit, and yes. they attacked it when That's we were true. in power. Okay. That's true, but no, also all when I'm your saying, party was in power, your income automatically doubled, didn't it? When our income went up, and it's gone up significantly more under social well, credit. The are first you cut people, are any or all politicians willing to take the same wage which they dish out to the poor? We all voted a cut this year in our salaries, every single one of us. Yes, and the okay, only fine. way you're I, going to get... That's not what I asked you. No, I asked look. you, were you willing? Was your party willing to take the same wage? We took a cut, and we voted for the cut, every single one of us. Wait, we did took that it right cut in bring wage. you down to the level of welfare? <laughs> well, <laughs> what is, you know, that argument is so irrational in terms of the kind of situation we're faced with. It's going, let's put everybody on welfare <laughs> rates, if that's what you want to do. Everybody what on a fixed income. To, what, would, would that not be the equality that you people preach? Of of course not. There are handicapped people out there. There are disadvantaged people out there. There are low-income earners out there. There are professional people. We have a mixed society that offers reward for skills. I am not opposed to that. What I want is opportunity for those rewards. Well, That's the key I am difference. Well, I'm actually saying is since the politicians today do not seem to be able to make the taxation money which is collected from the working people go around sufficiently to take care of all things. Do you not think, since we are also your bosses and the people who put up your salaries, that you should cut yourself, since you seem to be unable to agree among yourselves, we have, cut you down to okay. the level of a very good who cannot point. help themselves? Okay. Ma'am, right. you've made a very good point. What she's looking for is some leadership by the politicians who have fouled up the economies to sh a little bit of mea culpa. Look, I will. Okay, we're going to take a 20% okay. cut when times are bad. Look, Something we like voted that. for a cut this year. But, you know, I let her go on at some length because she was speaking from her heart, Look, I think. Of course she's speaking from her heart. There are a lot of people out there who are in one tough That's shape. That's why the teachers get no sympathy. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please. Okay. Hello? That's you, sir. Yeah, on this uh, gasoline nut, how can a fellow oh, afford to travel around and look for work if at these gas prices, what uh, it costs a person to drive, he can't go nowhere? I know, there's a problem. 
it's a real problem. In the old days when you're unemployed, you didn't have a car. Now everybody has a car and must have a car to get around to look for a job. Well, we're spending this vast sum on the exotic uh, lower mainland rapid transit program. They're cutting back on buses. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Are you against the LRT? There, uh, well, I'm just a simple Look, it is idiot. there and it is going ahead. I would have preferred a rational, light, rapid transit development on ground. on ground, built in British Columbia, out of our Squamish plant that was ready to go. Oh, I've forgotten the rail car yeah. plant. Go ahead, please. Mr. Barrett. Yes, ma'am. It feels like an eternity that we've been in this dilemma. Do you think the people of BC are going to have the patience to let you go ahead and do this job? Look, this province is more politically sophisticated than any other province in Canada. And it is also politically polarized. It is not a choice between Tweedledee and Tweedledum. We have a different philosophy. We have a different approach. In the three and a half years we're in government, we did many things very quickly. If I have one regret, I should have gone more slowly and explained step by step what we're doing. However, the things we did have stood the test of time. What I'm saying is, out of that experience, if we are given the opportunity to govern British Columbia again, we can pull ourselves out step by step from this mess. It will be painful. The first thing we must do is open every book of government, every Crown Corporation's book, everything. Lay it all out in front of public accounts. We must lay out in detail the debt that we've now inherited on the BC Hydro. The debt in British Columbia has gone from $4 billion in 1976 to $14 billion in just seven years. Let everybody have the truth. The truth never hurt anyone. As From there, we start bargaining on our resources to our offshore customers. We say we want fair access to markets and we want secondary investment for those resources. Wouldn't be fair to go back to good old days, days would it? The days of wine and roses and <laughs> euphoria. When everybody had a smile on their face. Yeah, remember the wine look, and roses and euphoria? Look. Remember how you rushed in with Angel Fear to try and, we did and had some, to back up every we second We did some day? magnificent things. We did some magnificent things. Is it going to be go slow bad if you win the next election? It'll be slower, more cautious, and more time on shows like this explaining exactly what we're doing. It's what fine. we did stood the test of time, the Petroleum Corporation, the land bill, but we did not, and it, I blame myself, no one else, we didn't take the time to bring people along with us. As an aging observer of okay. the political scene, <laughs> yes. I wish to express a great criticism of a body for which I campaigned endlessly for years, ICBC. Yeah. Is it not a shame, Mr. Barrett, that ICBC has become a self-perpetuating monopoly which by its very own breeding has doubled and tripled the cost of car repairs without any competition whatsoever. It is a shame that the government <laughs> closed down the car repair plant that we had as a measuring stick. Well, which they can't sell. Yes. All right. They closed it down. Its purpose was, and you know very well Bob Strachan set it up as a monitoring. The philosophy of ICBC was to keep the money here in BC. They're now taking the premiums of the school system and buying insurance elsewhere. It is a utility. If we went back to the jungle of the private insurance system, we would have those same old problems. ICBC is not perfect. This government is not committed to it philosoph philosophically, but it is far better than the days we had under the old system. Yeah, but they need a shot in the rump. I don't mind giving people a shot in the arm, but oh, don't throw shot out the... Shot in the rump, uh, not the, the arm. Don't throw shot out the, in the rump. Don't throw out the baby, baby with, with, with the, the bathwater. Bath. At the, the head of the next session, Mr. Barrett, and I'm telling this so Doug Hill, and then the else in Victoria can get it down clearly, turn on your little VCRs. What conditions, don't answer the question, do you proffer to Premier Bennett for a face-to-face -face Barrett debate with Bennett, with, of course, uh, our mutual friend Webster <laughs> doing the moderator? After the break. Mr. Barrett, uh, we came close to arranging a debate, debate between you and Mr. Bennett last time around. I was in the middle, and it didn't quite come off for some certain minor reasons. Let's put it to you first. 
What conditions, would you lay down any conditions for a face-to-face -face debate with Bennett? No conditions in public with access by other media, that's all. That's all, that's no conditions it. in public, access by other media. Yeah. A, a, a statement, a response, statement, response. No conditions on subject or anything else like that. You'd pick the... The, the, uh, the access by other media makes it messy. Well, okay. Because you lose control of the program and you might get some... Well, you have to work that out, but it's, it, 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 there has to be access for other media to pick up segments of it or whether, uh, anything else. It oh, yeah, total yeah. access. Yeah, that's what I mean. Video and tape recording yes, and newspaper. Yeah. yeah. No conditions. Yeah. In public, no holds barred. Of course. Equal time. Of course. And with or without telephone calls. I would probably, can't think of that. I, I don't know. know. Uh, whatever is put in front of me in that regard. Uh, I think, look, I think it's important at this crossroads election in British Columbia for the people of British Columbia to calmly have a chance to hear both positions and then make a choice. Go ahead to Dave Barrett. Uh, good morning. Mr. Barrett, will yes. there ever be any protection for renters in this province instead of just for the landlords? Well, <laughs> we brought in rent controls in British Columbia. It is a difficult, difficult subject, but we saw the effects of rent controls, the necessity of them. We see them working in some American jurisdictions. It is, a, it, it, it is always a problem, but they are still necessary, in my opinion, still would, necessary. Would you tend to reimpose rent controls at higher levels than presently are authorized? I think we're going to have to seriously look at it, particularly now that interest rates have dropped and the costs of providing such rental accommodation has relatively dropped as well. Go ahead from Victoria, please. Uh, well, Mr. Barrett and Mr. Webster, mm -hmm. uh, my question on, uh, on the apprenticeship, I'm uh, working as a mechanic for since 1955, and uh, in '69, I uh, like uh, took night school and got a refresher course, and I wrote my interprovincial examination, and they said they lost my paper. Well, okay. sir, let's take your number off the air, and perhaps one of Mr. Barrett's people will look at that. We can certainly do that. You take LD2 off the air, please. Uh, go ahead from Courtney. Hello, Jack. Yes. And how are you this morning, Mr. Barrett? Very good. Uh, first thing, Jack, uh, I'm sure glad that Mr. Bennett can afford to buy you a piece of ice cream because I can't afford to buy my kids ice cream. The next thing, J Mr. Barrett, yeah. now that, uh, that we are finally going to get some natural gas to the island, yeah. it's possibly a kick in the po uh, pig in the poke. They say they're going to put a fertilizer plant into Courtney. No. What is your position on that? Is it okay. going to come through the south or the north? Right. In 1979, I made the proposal that the uh, only way to uh, make it practicable, uh, practical for uh, natural gas to come to Vancouver Island was a secondary use, i.e. a fertilizer plant. I announced that Powell River was the logical site, and I announced that through the private sector, if they were willing to go that route, we would give that consideration, not hydro. This government is now going to public hearings to stall again. If the public, private sector, and this is Barrett of the NDP speaking, if the private sector comes up with the financing, if they put in the secondary commitment as West Coast proposed with that plant at Powell River, that would obviously be a more attractive proposal than adding more public debt to deliver gas to Vancouver Island. Fair enough, thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Yes, good morning. Morning. Um, I'd like to just uh, kind of inform you people that you might have to revise a couple of the lists you have there. Uh, 300 workers from KMA, Local 6, uh, an affiliate of Cominco, Canada, were uh, locked out off the job at midnight last night. You're talking about a strike, uh, a situation I happen to know about. You're talking about Western Canada Steel. I certainly am. Uh, 375 guys were given layoff uh, lockout notice by the management. Right on. I understand the union wanted 14% and 9%, and after protracted negotiations were offered only 0 and 5%. That's right. Well, uh, do you think you're right? Do you think you're entitled to 14 and 9% in this time? Uh, we're just not uh, uh, we're not ready for rollback concessions, that's all. Well, you're not, look, to, you're not doing this merely to put the, something up the snout of Kaminko, are you? I certainly am not. I'm just trying Look, to make a there is aware no, of... Uh, there's no way you can settle a labor dispute on a television program. I'm not even familiar with the details, but they're in the middle of a dispute. Oh, I'm, just, I'm not trying to settle anything. I'm just trying to inform Tell you. Tell us the bad all. news. Well, not much either one of us can do. The two parties are 
in the midst of a fight. Yeah, uh, and labor negotiations, and well, hopefully that you all get your heads knocked together and it's resolved. Oh, well, let's hope so. All the best. Thank you. Thank you very much. Go ahead, please. I just happened to pick that up yesterday. Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. Yes. Um, I have three questions for you, but first, in the, if you want to, in this, you wanted a, a confrontation between the, Mr. Barrett and Mr. Bennett. A no. debate. A debate. Yeah, it's a confrontation of air. But I think that uh, it's a practice in futility. You, uh, he's been on there this morning. He hasn't even said anything. I don't know what he said. And it's all its talk and nothing to it. Well. But the three questions I have here <laughs> is uh, one for you, Jack, and two for Mr. Barrett. The Northeast Coal. Um, what is it? And I'll say the, the two, three questions. And the other one would be. You're worse than we are. Give me the three questions. Okay. Uh, uh, one is northeast north coal and the southeast coal. Northeast coal, yes. Yeah, southeast and coal, then yes. It's, uh, then it's uh, uh, the outside. Uh, got Look, well, I'll go with the other one first, anyway. The southeast coal. You got uh, one. What is the difference? You know, they say that the northeast coal is bothering or taken away from the oh. southeast coal. Hold on, sir. Know? Would you please write me a letter? I haven't <laughs> got time for you to do all your thinking on the air. Okay. No, I would, see, I'm not running for election. I no, can, I got. I, I can, can be see, snarky. I can see that. All right. Okay. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hello. Yes. Is, yes. Is David there? Yes, I'm right here. Are you here, David? <laughs> yes, I am. David is here. First off, I just love your new philosophy: a chicken in every pot and duck orange for those of us who can afford it. But I want to ask one twice, and then I'll hang up so you can answer it on the okay. air. Um, on the matter of this Smithers teacher. Yes. Now. We've heard subsequently to all the foo for about it that Mr. Van der Zam contravened the boundaries of, of his office by publicly asking the board to do something. Yeah. Could you answer if this is right and if it is, what's going to be done about it? I don't know what's going to be done about it. The, the problem of sex education is always one that divides the community very rapidly. I think yeah. it was a mistake on the teacher's part to introduce that material. She has said that. The school board is left responsible to deal with it. I think it is a mistake for the minister to jump into the middle of the dispute when we have a democratically elected he school board. He was taking board. a natural, uh, natural opportunity for publicity. I must admit I was appalled myself when I saw it was sent home to the parents. Sure. A, a mistake was made. The minister jumped in, and I don't think either the mistake or the minister's reaction helped anything. Gut feeling. Well, of course, if I ask you if you'll win the election, of course I you'd say you will. I don't know. Are you ready to go? Yes, I'm ready to go. We've we got we? money in the bank. Well, we still need more. 517 East Broadway. Oh! <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Outboxed again by right. the old socialist, Wee Davy. After the break. <laughs> Dave Barrett of the NDP on Webster on check at midnight. Who knows what Webster will have tomorrow, 9 a.m. precisely.